Good morning. Apologies for the uh, late arrival. Um, technical difficulties. Um, it's a problem with my VPN here for, for anybody that knows about this stuff. So if it, it keeps coming up with a, an error message, I'll just click it off. But anyway, uh, yeah. So wow, that was fraught with, with um, worry and whatnot. Uh, my name's Dr. Pete Miller. So a little bit about myself. I work for the Vices Group. I you can't see my face, but I would normally start this by saying, don't be fooled by the boyishly handsome good looks. I'm, I'm a crusty old buffer. I, you know, I've been around the block. I've been in this, oh, blimey, since like 1985, 86. So I've seen a lot of stuff, most of which I, I don't really want to see again. And I'm I'm up to 38 countries, most of which I, I don't want to go back to either. Um, you know, I've, I've got the perfect face for radio. So you're, you're, you're lucky that this is just um, voice only. Um, and what I would normally start the, the, you know, any kind of lecture with is, you know, can people hear me at the back of the room and then go to can people understand me at the back of the room? So hopefully um, you can get past uh, my dodgy Irish accent and, and understand what I'm what I'm saying. So uh, a little bit about myself very quickly. Uh, my father always said I got more degrees than a thermometer. I've got five of them, including two doctorates. I've written 11 books, and if you stick around to the end, I'll give you a link to one of the books I wrote, which is on asset integrity management. It, it's a free book, um, you know, and, and hopefully you'll find that interesting as well. So um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll basically get started from now, so that should be enough about me. So, um, right, um, hope you see this picture. This, this picture is almost like a, a work of art as far as I'm concerned. Um, I tend to do a lot of my things and, and use the phrase rust never sleeps and, and that comes from a musician called Neil Young if you're you're old enough to remember him um, and Neil was definitely not a corrosion engineer um, but what he was was very very sharp because he was absolutely right rust does not sleep um, this photo uh, I used to work for three of the uh, ship classification societies and when I would come across pictures like this, I would I would send them to my you know, ex-colleagues and, and my friends in some of the class societies and go, hey, isn't isn't this one of your class ships? I'll um I'll not tell you what they what they actually said in the, in a reply, but uh, I do love this photo because it, it really just shows you um you know what happens when when rust you know is isn't controlled at all, and it, it's kind of sad actually in a way because at one stage this was obviously a very beautiful and, and new. Um, shiny, shiny boat, um, and you know, look what happened to it. Uh, once you stop caring and, and stop trying to protect it, uh, I think there's a, a lesson to be learned for all of us, actually. Um, so, when I finished my uh, undergraduate, uh, which was met metallurgy, um, I was walking out of the corrosion uh, um, exam, and so our professor came up and said, "So, what did you think, Pete?" And I said, "Ah, it wasn't too bad, Bob. It, it was pretty fair." And his advice to me was, you know, stick with corrosion because it will always pay the bills. Um, and, you know, absolutely right. So my young fella, um, he ended up doing a, a master's uh, in the same place that, that I did my, my postgrad stuff, actually, at Crampy in, in the UK. And when he, when he came out of his, his final exam, I said, so what did you think, kid? And he says, hey, dad, this corrosion stuff is easy. He says, it's just a couple of equations. You've got some oxygen. You've gotta have an electrolyte you know but it's it's pretty easy stuff to deal with and i kind of looked at him and i said you know what go crawl around a 20 year old bulk carrier or some dodgy old ship that's just you know been on the go for a lot of years or do a transit survey on something like a spud can on a on a jack up and then come and talk to me about how easy this this corrosion stuff is so, and that literally is what, what happened to me as well. So I, I had I'd finished, I had, I'd finished my PhD. It was corrosion fatigue of high strength steel in seawater. And I was, you know, quite literally one of the, the most knowledgeable guys on the planet about this stuff. Um, but I knew nothing, seriously, dumb as a box or rocks, that was me. So when I, when I joined my first company, they said, hey, Pete, we need someone that knows what they're they're doing to go and, and do a survey of, of the spud cans on a jack-up rig, which was in transit to uh, Rotterdam. So they flew me down to, to Bristol, got on a helicopter, went out onto the rig, um, crawled across, got onto the legs, down, 
top of the spud can through the hatch in and started looking and nothing that i did during my degrees prepared me for what i saw it was dark it was nasty it was smelly there was water slapping around the place there was corrosion everywhere this thing's creaking and groaning and you could literally see the cracks running in in the wells very scary experience i, I don't mind telling you and, it, and that was the version of it. it it actually got worse from there on for, for things that i i did because i i ended up becoming a, a ship surveyor and i crawled around some of the nastiest things that you ever really want to be in and, and seen some pretty horrible stuff um but it was great experience and that's that's where you know this next slide really comes in so my son and, and i'm sure a lot of people out there and i don't you know i'm not casting aspersions on people everybody has to learn but but the world has become the google generation and i i'm i'm old enough to to you know be before computers um and there's a picture there of a slide rule and, and fortunately I, I thought you would actually be able to see stuff i have i have my first slide rule with me here and it, it's from like 1968 um and that's that's what we used before computers and people in a sense had to think nowadays you can google something and you think you know it but you you really really don't um and again there, there's there's a quote there from the 1922 issue of, of printers inc and what it says was do not confuse education and experience and it is such a good good quotation now you're, you may have seen one in the last week or so about elon musk was supposed to have said do not confuse education with intelligence. Well, they actually didn't say it, um, but it, it, it's been around. I think Mark Twain said it a long, long time ago. But certainly um, in my case, you know, I, I came out, I was this bright, new, shiny, highly educated person with no experience at all. So one of my degrees, um, one of my doctorates is, is actually um, physician. So I'm not just a PhD doctor, I'm, I'm also a physician doctor, I'll give it all up. But um, if I was to say to you, who would you want performing a colonoscopy on you? Some young guy out of med school, two, three years, or some crusty old buffer that's been doing it for 20 or 30 years? Well, I was that guy. I had a colonoscopy, and for those that 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 are young enough and are, are you know, well, it's not going to be happening to me. Hey, laugh it up, fuzzball, as Han Solo says, because it's coming your way at some stage. Well, guy did a colonoscopy in me and actually poked a hole in me. He was just a young guy. Um, emergency surgery, they fixed me up great, but um, you know, I in my year in, in anatomy lab, I, I've had someone's colon in my hand, quite a few, and other bits of their bodies, and it's really difficult to poke a hole in, in your intestines. But this young, inexperienced guy did it. And you know, it's pretty much the same with, with corrosion and platforms and refineries and things like that. You know, you really want to be talking to the, the right people. You need the older guys mentoring the young people because, you know, they, they don't know it, and there's so much stuff out there. Um, one of the things, uh, an expression which you, you, you may have heard of is, um, um, do you, uh, oh, uh, was it, say nothing and have people think you're stupid or open your mouth and, and have them confirm it, right? Well, that sort of stuff doesn't apply to corrosion engineers. Um, ask questions. I, in my experience, and I, I was the why dad, why kid, people were incredibly kind to me and incredibly helpful. And I learned so much from the older guys that had been around the block. So, you know, if you're a, a young guy here and, and you know, you're kind of shy and it's like, well, I don't want to say it in case they don't think I know anything, don't say it. Ask the questions, get the knowledge, pick the brains of, of the guys that, that have been there and, and done it and seen it. So, um, right, this is this is the lecture bit, and I'll, I'll pass over it fairly quickly because, you, you know, in a sense, you, you don't really need to know it. You, you have, as my son said, a couple of equations. So, you know, the anodic reaction, and if you look at that drawing there, the little brown rusty spot, just, just keep that in your mind because that, that becomes fairly important later on. Um, the cathodic re reaction where you're producing hydroxyl ions, then you combine these, you get to iron hydroxide, which again is further oxidized and then becomes Fe2O3 or Fe2O4. 
Um, and that's that's your rust. And everybody sees um, the the red color rust primarily because you know it's everywhere outside. You can have the black stuff if there's limited oxygen. You you tend to find it inside of, of pipes and things like that where there is some kind of of oxygen starvation in a, in a sense. Um, but that's that's pretty much what it is. That that's what rust is. Now we could talk about other kinds of corrosion with other kinds of metals, but I'm I'm really going to just stick to um, the iron and steel and, and the rusty stuff for, for today. So what types of corrosion do you have? Uh, there's a whole bunch of them, but the ones that we primarily deal with is atmospheric corrosion. And again, if you looking back at that picture of, of the ship sitting on, on the beach, the coastal region is 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 tough because you know you, you've got salt in the air, you've got lots of moisture in the air. If you were to put a similar piece of steel one layer on a beach or beside a beach and one layer in a desert, the desert one won't, won't rust or will minimally rust because there, there's no moisture. It tends to be very, very dry. And that's that's the electrolyte. You know, galvanic corrosion, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit more, is, is literally when you have two different metals linked together and one will one will corrode preferentially. Crevice corrosion. So going back to that, that last slide with the little red rusty bit, that the rusty bit is the anode. The, the bit that isn't rusting is the cathode. And what you never want to hear is someone saying, we have a large, can, a large cathode, small anode situation, because then that's where you're getting the preferential corrosion to. And that, that can form crevices. And basically, you will get accelerated corrosion in there. Or physical crevice corrosion, you'll get things like differential aeration, et cetera. Erosion corrosion. I know you'll you'll see that especially offshore um, on uh, import lines, export lines. If there's if there's no sand traps or or separators for it, you know. Um, corrosion under insulation, the bug end of the market. Um, big fan of the corrosion under insulation. So what a lot of people don't know is that there's a difference between bacteria and and viruses. Viruses are just dumb bits of protein. They they invade a cell. They basically use your cells bits to multiply and destroy the cell and, and move on. Bacteria don't do that. Bacteria are basically alive. They're a life form on their own. They have all the organelles that that we have in our cells. They use ADP. They are um, as I say, just little pieces of of life. But what they do is they also communicate with each other. Um, and there's a there's a theory actually that that we basically came about a gazillion years ago because a cell basically captured a bacteria and started to use the organelles in, inside it. Um, microbial and in, induced corrosion, as I say, corrosion under insulation is a, a big one, and I'll talk more about that. And then you have the other ones like stress corrosion, cracking. Um, be, being a, a, a doctor, you know, there's a, a, a wonderful expression which says, if you hear hoof beats, think horses. Which means that you know if you come in with a sore stomach, the chances are it's some bacterial infection. It could be cancer, it could be Crohn's disease, it could be a whole bunch of other things, but it also could be two or three of them happening at the same time. And all those different types of corrosion that I, I've shown you there, they're not mutually exclusive. They they can all happen at, at the same time. So be aware of that. Um, but the same way that that. Uh, Neil Young wasn't a corrosion engineer. Mike Tyson has never been classed as a philosopher, but he has a great expression. And he says, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. And it's so true when it comes to corrosion. That picture that you're, you're looking at there, um, that's off a platform or was a platform in the North Sea long, long time ago. I love the picture, I've, I've used it a lot because um, it shows, and it wasn't a, a platform that was, that was uh, you know, being downmanned and, and, and ready for to be decommissioned. It was a live ongoing platform. And you say to yourself, man, these guys must have had a plan where they inspected it, they, they painted it, they maintained it, you know, and something came along to punch them right in the face. Um, because look at the state of that. Now, in those days, platforms were all like over designed. So, you know, is that bad? Yeah, pretty right. It's, it's bad. But does it mean that the platform is going to fall down? No, probably not. But um, yeah, um, a friend of mine was all about planning and, and preparation. Well, you know, it's, it's great and, and you should be doing that. But sometimes the plans just don't work out the way you thought they would. Okay, so that's the rusty bit. How, how do we stop it? You know, the, the classic 
answer is, well, if you don't want it to rust, make it out of something that doesn't rust. Well, great. Or you could, what they say, alloy up, use different grades of material, et cetera, which are, are more, more corrosion resistant. Um, not always possible to do that. So we look at things like barriers, you know, paints, coatings, you know, stainless steel, whatever, which would have an oxide film, something like that. Um, but the problem is, again, that the whole punch in the face thing, that, that picture is one I took a long time ago and I was on a, a offshore facility and I got on and it looked fantastic. It really was, it, it had been painted up. It was, it was I walked from the, the heli deck down to the accommodation platform, went for a walk around and I'm thinking, my God, this is, this is looking good, so it is. And again, a, a friend of mine who's an oncologist says, you know, if you walk into his room and you're looking pretty awful, things probably aren't good with you. But if you're looking in relatively healthy and, and you know, there's maybe a chance we can, we can do something for you. And it's the same with platforms or facilities. So once I started walking past the, 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 you know, the main parts, I started seeing stuff like this. And it's like, well, wh what, what's going on? What, what's happening? Um, and what had turned out was that they had blown all their budget because the, the CEO or one of the big muckety mucks was coming out to have a look. And um, they painted everything where he was going to walk and where he was going to see. And they, they blew the budget for the actual maintenance stuff that they had to do. Um, another thing was, I, I'm asking a guy and I says, you know, so what is it? What's the story with that? And his, his reply was nothing to do with me. I'm just the electrician. And it was like, but it really has something to do with you. I mean, it's the way we all talk about now health and safety is, is everybody's concern. Well, you know, corrosion is, is exactly the same. You know, you can do something about it. And one of the things, I have a, a thing there that says wall of shame. Um, I was in a facility and it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen because when you walk down the control room, there was a wall and, or to the control room, there was a wall and then people had put pictures on the wall of things that they had found, rusty bits, um, you know, dents in pipes, bits of insulation missing. And they had, they had basically pinned it to the wall and where it was and when they did it. And this was for me fantastic because you had people in the facility that were getting involved in not only the corrosion management, but, but the actual asset integrity of, of the facility as well. It was just such a great, great idea. Um, I wish, wish more people would, would be as involved as that. Um, another way of stopping it, especially uh, with regards to uh, offshore and, and onshore as well, actually, pipelines, is uh, for cathodic protection. So it goes back to what I was saying about using you know, galvanic corrosion. You, you have a metal which will literally sacrifice itself when you connect it to protect the other one. Um, they tend to be made of mixtures of aluminium, zinc, magnesium. They tend to be a fixed potential because that's what the, you know, that piece of metal will give um, a certain voltage when immersed in, in seawater. Um, I don't know how you guys came across this, but for me, it was when I was a kid and it was, it was what was called Peter Smith. And Peter Smith was, Peter Smith caught my Aunt Zena in the larder here, carefully munching some purple grapes. Now, when I was looking for a, an image to put up here, they didn't, they didn't have uh, platinum on it. Um, and if you notice, I said purple grapes, which would be platinum then gold. But um, things have changed since, since I was a kid, and now it's, it's gold and platinum because platinum is, is believed to be less reactive than gold. So we maybe need to change it to carefully munching some um, green green pears or, or something like that. But anyway, what, what that table is basically showing you is that you have iron and if you connect zinc or aluminium or magnesium to it, it will actually react more than what the iron does. Um, and it will give out electrons, as you, if you remember back to those equations. And in a sense, what it's really doing is it, it is sacrificing it itself. Um, to protect the other one. And that's that's literally what cathodic protection is. So there is a problem with it though, um, you know, punched in the face. So there are two um, sacrificial anodes. And what has happened is the one on the, the left, it, it, it's called passivation. So something happens to stop that um, anode reacting. There you'll, you'll see marine growth. And I, I've seen videos of, of platforms 
with you know marine growth that literally have, have just killed the anodes. They're just not working. You've had the, the guys in, divers, ROVs, water jetting to try and clean the stuff off them because there is an anode that is absolutely and utterly useless. Then, depending on the composition of the anodes, um, they put certain things in to try and stop them from passivating. But anodes, they, they will never just basically corrode at a uniform rate over the whole surface. And, and the picture on the right shows you what happens as an anode goes through its life. Now, what you're probably saying to yourself, well, how effective are they at this stage? Well, guess what? They're actually not very effective at all, so they're not. So there's another way of doing it. And that's what's called an impressed current. And basically what you're doing is you're connecting the anode to the structure with a, a box of, of electric. And what the electric is doing is forcing the electrons into the structure, which is really stopping the, um, the reaction. Okay. Um, the, you, can, you will still lose um, the anode, it will still corrode, but, but, but much slower. So, well, and these, these um, systems can last forever. Um, the difference with them is that you can get a variable potential. So, the way I tend to look at electric is it's a waterfall. The voltage is the height of the waterfall, and the answer is the water that's coming over it. So with your, with your um, sacrificial anode, you have the anode giving a certain voltage, and depending on the surface area, et cetera, you will have um, you know, a, 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 a current that's being drawn from it. Well, obviously, as, as the anode starts to waste or it starts to become passivated, you will get less and less of, of that current. So the effectiveness of it is, is, is much, much less. Um, with this here, you can actually vary the potential. You have a better throwing rate, etc. So, um, impressed current is is effectively a, a, a better system, but you, you can't use them all, all the time. Um, the problem with them is that you can have overprotection. So, depending on who you're reading, depending on which reference electrode you use, the um, correct potential is around about 850 millivolts, something like that. What you don't want to do is start going over that because you start generating hydrogen. It, it's the classic electrolysis of water. And, and you must have did that as a, as a kid in school, you know, where they would they put electrodes in water and you'd have a test tube full of hydrogen and a test tube full of oxygen. Well, that's basically what happens on the surface of what you're trying to protect if, if you have a, an overprotection system going on. And hydrogen. You know, I, I don't know anything about American football, but, you know, soccer, football that I grew up with, you know, your, your forward, he was the guy that, that beat his way through the defence, you know, and scored the goal. Well, hydrogen is exactly the same. It's obviously very, very small. It gets in, it, it hooks into, you know, any of the rubbish that you've, you've got in, in your steel, if it tends to be a, a dirty steel, it can actually even, you know, triple points on, on grain boundaries and, and form hydrogen. And you will get what that photo shows, classic stepwise cracking um, on, on hydrogen embrittlement. Onshore, you start getting into the more nasty stuff, especially when you get high temperatures involved. Um, you know, high temperature hydrogen attack, which is incredibly difficult to um, detect. And there's been some major disasters uh, because of it. In the old days, you know, the steel was dirty. People didn't understand. Now, now you have um, you know, much more awareness of it and an awful lot of research has been done on it with the curves that, that show you where you should be operating in temperatures and hydrogen concentration. So, and, and people literally are replacing a lot of the, the problematic stuff, but it, it's still, it's still um, a big problem for um, you know, older refineries and, and anything with, with high temperature, fertilizer plants, that sort of stuff. Um, so let me let me give you a couple of, uh, of examples of stuff I've come across. Um, so that picture there, uh, it basically speaks a thousand words. So it does. If you've got seawater, you've got bacteria, you've got marine growth, you've got all sorts of stuff. So when I see something like that, it's not about how do we fix it. It's about how the heck did it happen in the first place? You know, your plan, your inspection plan. Now, okay. Let's say you have a, a system, you, you really should be putting some kind of biocide in it. You should be putting sodium hypochlorite, which is, is to basically kill any of the, you know, stop the, the biofouling. But you should be monitoring the system. I mean, surely there was a flow meter on that line at some stage and people are going, hmm, 
guess what? We're only getting three thimble spools through an hour now instead of 20 gallons. How, how, do you, how does something like that get to that? Marine growth, uh, what I remember right, and it was more about the food stuff, but you were talking about something like um, it would go from a seed to fully grown in about 18 months. Um, you know, so let's say that took, I don't know, two years for that to happen. You know, somebody should have known. And even if it was a bypass line, you should have a plan somewhere that's saying every six months you flush it or you oh, inspect it, whatever. But yeah, really, how, how do you get a situation like that? Um, on a system, and it was seawater injection. So what normally happens with seawater injection, you're taking seawater, you're basically treating it, you're trying to get rid of the oxygen because oxygen is normally the, the, the main process you have. Most places have a, a, a physical oxygen removal system, something like a main ox unit. And then what you do is you use an O2 scavenger. And you're trying to go from, if I remember what it, if the numbers are, it was 500 million parts per billion or something like that down to, to 10 parts per billion. Sorry, first number is probably, I don't actually make it right. But um, you're not going to do that. You know, the, 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 the number crunchers will tell you, yeah, we don't need a mine ox unit. We can, we can use the scavenger. We're fine. We're only putting this amount through. We're only doing this. We can handle it. 15, 12, 13 years down the line, you find out that, you know what? There is no systematic measurement for the oxygen. The O2 meters that they had on the line don't work. They never repaired them. They never replaced them. So they've got no true measure of what oxygen is actually in the line. They have changed their water injection amount. So they're maybe we're running at 30%, now they're at 50%. Are they increasing the amount of scavenger to, to cope with the amount of oxygen they, they have now? Or maybe it changes and no one, you know, well, in, in the case that I'm talking about, it was a manual pump. That, that varied the amount of scavenger that went in. The pump hadn't been calibrated in forever. So you probably aren't surprised that when the system was down for six months or whatever, when they started up again, it started moonlighting as a, as a water sprinkler system. And people are wondering, well, why, you know, why have we got so much corrosion? Why have so much bad, bad problems on it? You know, information and data, it just wasn't there. The punch in the face. Other one, if you, if you look at um, produced water, produced water tends to be full of, well, actually not really full of bacteria. They're, the system gets bacteria into them. So you normally just treat them with, with biocide and you're good to go. Um, you know, the type of bacteria that you get in there are sulfate reducing bacteria or acid producing bacteria. And I say bacteria are really, really smart little things. So system I was looking at one time, um, they had incredibly high uh, bug counts. And once you get over about 10 to the six, a million, you know, you're, you're in, in the wrong end of the world, so you are. And these guys weren't able to control that. And it was all about, you know, what, what are we doing with the, with the bug count? What are, what are we doing? You know, how, how can we control this? And the more you start looking into it, so the doctor part of me is going, well, what about bacterial resistance? You know, you've been using the same biocide for the last 10, 12, 13 years. Is there, is there a resistance to it? Um, it happens in, in humans. You know, why would it not happen in, in other systems? You know, that's why penicillin now is, is absolutely useless. Less than 100 years, bacteria are just, they laugh it off. So they did. Could that have been a possibility? You know, do we need to change the biocide? Um, so then you start looking a little bit more and it's, you know, again, if you see, if you hear hoof boots, hoof peats, think horses, but it could be zebras. Well, this was a case of zebras. So once you started looking at the history, there was a case of the, the bilge water was dumped into this produced water system or find its way into the produced water system. The whole design of the caissons and everything was, was totally and utterly wrong. It just wasn't fit for purpose. You had bacterial masses in, in the recovered oil tank. You had bacterial masses in other tanks. There was no way of killing it because within 24 to 36 hours, you were having regeneration of, of the bug count back over, back over a million. So you start looking and going, well, what else? So they, they had holes in the pipes. Oh, there's a surprise. And we looked at one, an old report, and it showed that there was a, a layer of about an inch of gunk is the only thing I can describe it on the bottom 
of the the pipes now how extensive was that i don't know i i ended up leaving before we ever got to the bottom of it but um, so i don't know how extensive it was but part of that once we analyzed it was all sort of particles that were coming from grit blasting on the top deck um or through, through, through the, the platform and um, you know initially when you see the silicate stuff you think is it sand is there something in the produced water that, that they're not they're not scrubbing out or they're not separating but no it wasn't it was it was literally the grit blast had been getting in to the produced water system, forming a layer, which literally just became a bacterial hive, so it did. How do you clean that? You're not going to, Agent Orange won't clean that stuff. You really need to get in and start cleaning out the pipes and, and you know, doing some really, really good housekeeping. But that is just to show you that, you know, what started off literally as a bacterial problem turned out to be something far, far greater. Um, and yeah, they were having corrosion all over the place and leaks all over the place. No, it's kind of getting worse too. Um, corrosion under insulation. This this is a beauty. You know, if someone can come up with a solution to corrosion under insulation, you're going to make a fortune. So you are. They it's you know basically remove the insulation. That that's what you need to do. Um, they've tried different techniques: radiology, pulsed eddy current, and believe it or not, in Norway they come up with with using sniffer dogs. I mean, dogs have incredible um, olfactory senses, um, and what they were doing is they were taking samples of air from literally underneath the insulation and seeing if dogs could detect could detect if there were uh, if there was corrosion on, underneath it. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but it wasn't it wasn't something where they're they're flying three kennels out to a platform for uh, part of their inspection program. Um, corrosion fatigue. So, as I said, my PhD was was this um, near and dear to my heart. Uh, the thing with corrosion, and well, the thing with fatigue is that most of the life is spent through initiation. The unzipping part happens really, really quick, and then the end of failure. But that initiation takes up maybe ninety percent of, of the life of, of the fatigue or of the, the actual fatigue life, um, unless you have a weld. If you have any kind of welding. You can forget that initiation. Your crack's already there. And then you get what's called synergistic, which is the $20 word for what I like to think of two plus two equals five. But basically, the, 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 the sum is greater than the parts in many ways. Um, and what I found from my res research was that, that fatigue in inner air was like 100,000 cycles. Fatigue in seawater was 10,000 cycles. Fatigue, once you started getting over protection, it went down to like a thousand cycles. We're talking orders of magnitude on this. So that's why I'm saying, you know, hydrogen and, and over protection is not a good thing, especially when you've got corrosion involved. And there, unfortunately, is, is one of the worst examples of it. And that, that was in 1980. Um, and so when I, I started my PhD and or master's and PhD in, in 1981, this was a hot topic. So it was 123 people killed on the Alexander Keeling, or Shelland, I think is the correct way of pronouncing it. Um, and it started literally as a small crack on a, a hydrophone weld, which was just one thing they put on one of the, the, the braces um, to detect for, for water leakage. And unfortunately, fatigue, corrosion, um, the crack literally unzipped around the brace, um, and it then caused one of the, the the legs to fall off, and it and it capsized and and killed all those people. Um, you know, and you had there had a tragedy that that started with uh, you know a crack that was probably less than a millimeter in length. So not not good. Um, so what I to like to think of is again go back to the human body thing. You know, you you go to the doctor different ways the different times in your your life you kid you're, you're kind of sick you're old you're sick in the middle and there's your buster leg or something you're, you're pretty much good to go um but with the same respect you will not inspect a 30 year old facility the same the way you do as, as a brand new one it, it has to change you know and you have to be aware that it's changing and then you get the old guys that you know if they're if they're not helping and training up the young guys or imparting that knowledge you will lose the tribal knowledge so you will you know well, what should we do i don't know joe used to do that well, where's joe well, joe's gone you know oh, okay 
So it's about you know trying to, to train people up and trying to capture that, that tribal knowledge and be aware that you need to change systems and you need to look at, at how things are, are going and, and you know um, change stuff accordingly. Of course, with, with older stuff, you, you have two competing uh, trains of thought. So you've got the accountants and the bean or the bean counters and the and the you know the the spanner jockeys or whatever, um, the range the range guys. Is, Called here. So, you know, the accountant's saying, you know, we don't need to spend this money because we're going to be divesting of it in, in a certain number of years. And you've got the engineers are saying, well, look, we need to keep spending the money because things are getting worse and we need to keep it safe. We need to keep it operational and value for the company and all this sort of stuff. And again, you'll, you'll, you've already read it. You know, my father's expression, which was so good a long time ago, and he said, some of the worst engineering decisions ever made were made by accountants. And it, it's so true. Um, right, come, in, come to the end, chaps, as you, you'll probably be glad to hear. Um, again, you know, when you have your inspection plan and you got it to gather data, you know, the world has gone Google, it's all about data, it's all about information. But as I say, just, just remember Mike Tyson, and I, I think this joke uh, sums it all up. So you get this blokey comes in and he says, hey, my eye watch tells me my blood pressure is 120 over 70, my pulse is 68. My temperature is 98.5. My respiration rate is 18 breaths per minute. And I've taken 6,217 steps today. Big cheesy grin and smile on his face. His wife turns around to him and says, pity it didn't tell you it was our wedding anniversary today. Uh-oh, right? So that kind of shows you there's good data, there's bad data, and there's the right data. And so much of it isn't about the how much got data we've got, how much we've gathered, and look, our new system has taken 42 corrosion readings every second, or thickness readings every second, we're on top of this. It's about having the right data when you need it, where you need it, manipulating it. You know, going back to that, that um, produced water, we had so much data on, on bug counts and dosage rates, and it was, we still couldn't control it because we didn't have the right information. The right information was about, there is so much stuff in the system. We've got bacterial hives, we need to do something else. So as I say, in, in the, the world of, of Google and, and look at this new fancy stuff and we can do this and, you know, as my dad would say, we can do half an hour in 15 minutes. It's about having the right data and using the right data. And that's, as I say, is pretty much it. I mean, for those of you that, that stuck it out, thank you very much. So one of the books that I have written is this one here. It's Asset Integrity Management Handbook. Um, I wrote it to, to, in a sense, put old heads on young shoulders. Um, it's free. I never wanted any money for it. I never, you know, I blagged, stole, coerced, nicked stuff from, from lots of people who I've I've given credit for. Um, and it's it's free to download. So asset integrity jigsaw, which should be fairly easy to remember. Go get it. Um, it talks about corrosion, it talks about inspection, it talks about things like bow tie, it talks about Swiss cheese models, it tells you how to set up asset integrity systems, it tells you, you know, stuff about inspection stuff, um, tells you where to go to get other good stuff that, that's free. Um, so yeah, you know, check it out and, and uh, you know, I hope you in, enjoy it. And I say, I, I hope that uh, it, it's, it's of, of use to people. So what normally would happen here is, you know, questions, if, if people have any, any questions, I'm obviously happy to answer them. So, and I think the questions, things go through Mark and I, I know that um, some people I think were, were sending in questions. Um, so there was, and I think I, hang on, I'll take a note. There was, there was one that someone had said, oh, what was it? Um, uh, okay, so one of the questions was, what would I say to a young corrosion engineer that, that's now coming, um, and you know, just in, into the business, you know, uh, the advice I would give them really is one: ask questions. You, you heard me say that later on. You know, it's about trying to gain as much knowledge and practical knowledge as as you possibly can. Two: develop a passion for what you're doing. 
you know, I yeah, I've got a whole bunch of degrees. I'm supposed to be relatively intelligent, but I'm not. I'm dumb as a box of rocks. But what got me through all this was a passion. I, I wanted to know why things were happening. It wasn't just about trying to fix it. It was about why are they happening in the first place? What else can we do? So that would be my advice. Go, go ask the questions. Pick people's brains. Next thing would be do the dirty jobs. You know, I was sent to Vietnam. I was sent to places where it was a case of, hey, Pete, we need somebody to go there. You know, and I'm going, I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah. And I saw stuff that that most people will never see. And it, it's about that experience. It's about getting it. So, you know, stand up and go, heck, yeah, I'll do it. And also, I find uh, much more empathy with with people that will come and say, one, you know, we're trying to do something and it's then they may not have the experience, they may not have the knowledge. Hey, Pete, could I have a try at this? Can I have a run at it? You know, I know I'm not going to be successful and I know I'm not going to do good, but can I at least try some of it and, and ask someone to help me? That's great. That's the sort of stuff that you, you want to be doing, really and truly. And, um, you know, as I say, it's it's about trying to to learn from people that know and put yourself in places where you, you get that experience and get that knowledge. Um, and I think I, I don't see anything else coming through from Mark. So um, and again, you'll have to excuse me, I've never, never used this thing before. It's only standing up in front of people. So I'm, if I'm supposed to do something and I, I didn't, uh, I guess I didn't. So guys, I really appreciate you coming in and I say I hope you, you find it um, you know, relatively educational or entertaining and, and again, thank you very much. Um, thanks, bye-bye.